So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Sri Hari, and I work for ThoughtWorks. Uh, I just uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for that presentation. On that, I think, uh, I'll have a few counter arguments to what uh, arguments he presented in the previous uh, talk because this talk is all about how can you still use SQL and get you know leverage a lot of uh, the modern infrastructure based on Hadoop and so on. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure we'll have a lot of uh, interesting conversations offline too as well on this. Uh, so, I'm not sure how many of you have been following up this, uh, you know, a set of announcements that has been coming from different players in the Hadoop uh, space over the last six months or so. Uh, let me start by sharing a couple of uh, clippings and then we are, that kind of will set the precedent for what I really want to cover in the remainder of the talk. Uh, first, there was this, uh, this uh, announcement from a company called Link, uh, Concurrent, which makes this, uh, just, you know, open source the software called Link. <coughs> Uh, concurrent, if you are uh, familiar with this tool called Cascading, uh, which, is, which helps you kind of orchestrate the MapReduce pipelines, or create MapReduce pipelines. Uh, you will you'll be familiar with the company called Concurrent, which makes that software. Uh, they created this software, this uh, SQL processor called Lingual. So Lingual is basically like a layer that is above, uh, concur above Cascading, uh, which helps you write SQL, and then that translates that into a set of MapReduce uh, jobs, and, and a bunch of Cascading code effectively, which in turn is Want to convert that into MapReduce, uh, into MapReduce pipeline. Uh, and then there was another announcement from the uh, Green Plum guys. The Green Plum uh, data parallel database, which is now part of uh, EMC, they released a, a SQL processor called Hawk. And uh, what this does is a little bit interesting. It doesn't really convert SQL into MapReduce, like how uh, Lingua does it, or like how uh, Hive does it, and so on. Instead, it directly executes the SQL statements on the data that is residing in uh, HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. <clears throat> so I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here that everybody knows what is Hadoop and what is HDFS and so on. So, so bear, so bear with me if, it, if it's uh, if it's going to get a little bit more than uh, if you if I that assumption. Is that assumption largely correct? A uh, lot of a lot of you know what is Hadoop and use Hadoop. I'm sure it's been around for enough time that people are quite familiar with it. Uh, and then on the back of this announcement, very quickly, uh, the, the Teradata guys came up with their own, uh, you know, version of uh, their SQL processor. They are calling it SQL Edge, and uh, this is also very similar to what Greenplum does, uh, which is directly it executes SQL on uh, the file system and not going through MapReduce. Uh, so if you just take a look at these, and this is a little old, and I think in the last three four months uh, we have had even IBM, we have had uh, Cloudera, which is the leader of the space with the Hadoop distributions. Uh, they, they announced their Impala, general availability of their version called, uh, of their uh, distributed query processor called Impala. And the Apache community is, uh, the, the Apache community is also working on a, on a project which is sponsored by MapR Technologies called Apache Driven. And so there's a lot of traction that is starting to build in the SQL and Hadoop uh, space. To a great extent, what they are, uh, uh, what they have started to do is uh, see how you can actually, instead of converting your analytics team or your data warehousing team into a set of map use experts, how can you really, you know, make, uh, you know, piggyback on the familiar user experience of SQL and still be able to combine that uh, experience with the modern infrastructure that's coming out through Hadoop and so on. So that's the general trajectory in which things are actually moving uh, in, in this, in this, uh, in the Hadoop space. So uh, this is the reason why I kind of decided to call this, uh, you know, talk as it takes uh, two to tango. And, uh, it takes, it takes two to tango and uh, what really I want to do for the remainder of this talk is uh, probably there are two parts to it. Uh, one, I would like to explore a little bit about uh, how did we really get here and try to kind of answer that uh, question of if, why does it make sense for Hadoop to actually be the next big step? Uh, why does it uh, you know uh, make sense for SQL to be the next big step in the Hadoop uh, journey and how, how are these two things related and so on. And uh, the first part will actually focus on the evolution and how, how did we really get here as part of the story. And the second part is where I'd like to focus a little bit on the mechanics or how are people actually doing SQL on Hadoop, what are the different technical implementations and what are the, what are the architectural direction that people are taking, the trade-offs that they are making and so on. Because the number of players includes you know, the big bigs like EMZ and IBM and even Microsoft for that matter as you can see down the line. So that's the broad, that's broadly how I have broken up this whole uh, talk. We have these two sections, one the, the history part and then the uh, second part is about the mechanics of uh, how SQL and Hadoop is actually done. 
So we'll start off with a brief kind of a retrospective. How did we really kind of get here? So I'll just start a little bit of uh, how did or what is big data crunching like uh, before it open, after it open, and you know during the end, during this phase, and so on. And uh, broadly, if you kind of want to classify the Hadoop journey so far, uh, but just you can classify it into three different phases. Uh, first is the phase when Hadoop did not exist. Uh, still, we were doing a lot of large-scale data processing even during the time when Hadoop was not there. Uh, we, were do, we were using a different set of technical solutions and so on. Uh, let's focus a little bit on that first. And then the second part is when it started out as an open source project. Uh, and at the point in time when it started out as an open source project, it had nothing to really do with uh, either uh, databases or SQL or anything like that. It was for a very different purpose that the journey actually began, when dark cutting actually started, right? And then the third phase is when uh, it was eventually adopted by Yahoo and uh, you know they went from something like you know few nodes to 4,000 node clusters by early 2007 or mid-2007. And then uh, along the, and then since then it has not you know taken a backseat. There have been a lot of backlash, a lot of criticisms about uh, what Hadoop is trying to do and so on. But despite that, its adoption has grown and uh, until now where it has actually reached the peak of the hype cycle, if I, I can actually say that. So these are the three broad phases that I'll be covering. So we'll start with uh, what was the world like before Hadoop. So even before Hadoop, uh, people were using, uh, there were enough, uh, they were not calling it big data, but then the data was big in different enterprises. For example, the oil and natural gas industry has always dealt with large amount of sensor data and the volume data processing volumes has been significantly high all through the, through the time. And uh, predominantly if you were building, uh, if you wanted to like, you know, scale your uh, OLTP systems, online transaction processing systems, you t the typical solution that people resorted to was uh, partitioned and sharded databases. They would partition it, they, that is Oracle or MySQL or whatever the database you have. Partitioning was, the, and it's still to a great extent, that is the solution that's actually followed. Uh, when it came to a lot of analytical reporting kind of workloads, uh, there are uh, you know enterprise data warehouses were the first uh, level of solution. Uh, you would consolidate all your data that's coming from different transactional systems into a single warehouse, and then have a denormalized schema, and then you kind of run a lot of queries on that, which would be your reporting queries and so on. That's a typical approach. Uh, a further uh, extension or a, an evolution of uh, data uh, data warehouses was your parallel databases, and massively what they were referred to as massively parallel data. Now, uh, I think the, the most interesting beast in this entire category is actually the massive, massively parallel databases. So when, uh, when I say massively parallel databases, I'm referring to the likes of Teradata and Greenplum and uh, Vertica and so on. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to explain uh, some of the architectural elements of uh, the of mass, massively parallel databases. And uh, all these massively parallel databases, they kind of followed this uh, model called the shared nothing architecture. And uh, what we really mean by that is uh, you have a bunch of computers who don't share any hard disk or memory or whatever. They are just strung together by a high speed uh, a, a high speed network. And then you have a coordinating node there, which is the gateway to the rest of the world. So anytime you want to issue a query or work with this database or load data and stuff like that, you would you know talk to the coordinating node, and that based on uh, the way it had actually laid out the data on different uh, compute nodes. Uh, it would actually, you know, figure out and coordinate and create a query plan and then execute the query on these different uh, on these different machines. So that's a typical way in which these guys actually function. Now, uh, if you just go back and uh, study some of the research and some of the observations uh, that they are some of the experiences actually that have actually that people have put out from their use of uh, massively parallel databases like Greenplum and Teradata, etc. Uh, what you will really notice there is that uh, these parallel parallel databases. Uh, at best have kind of scaled to tens of nodes and you don't hear them scaling to things like hundreds of nodes or thousands of nodes uh, as what you would hear in the case of Hadoop and it's on the other, the other technologies. And now if you actually dig a little deeper and try to understand why that has been the case, uh, it kind of will take you down to the assumptions based on which uh, parallel databases were built. Uh, parallel databases came out of a lot of research in the RDBMS field that happened during the late 80s. Uh, Teradata and other companies were found during that time. Uh, so a lot of assumptions that were made in the construction of these databases, in the design and the development of these databases are primarily responsible. I'll quickly run you through a couple of interesting observations there, or assumptions over there. Uh, first and the foremost uh, is that um, as the, uh, one of the reasons why it doesn't kind of scale to many, many nodes is for, uh, into hundreds of nodes and so on, is primarily because as the number of uh, nodes in any compute cluster increases, uh, failures become more and more common. And uh, in the design of these databases, at least uh, until, uh, not, until, not until now, 
uh, you know, what uh, they were based on the assumption that uh, the, the, the nodes are never, not, never really going to go down. It was fundamentally based on the idea that uh, the nodes are going to be running up and running. And the kind of fault tolerance that you see baked in Hadoop is not, you know, upfront engineered in these kind of in the, in the parallel databases. The other reason why uh, they don't scale is because uh, these uh, parallel databases, uh, they kind of assume that these compute nodes that you see down here are actually homogeneous in the sense that they are all of the same kind of hardware. So they are not, you know, different hardware. Okay. So uh, given that, as the number of nodes actually increases, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult for you to maintain that homogeneity. And compare and contrast that with uh, the design principles of MacReduce and Hadoop, is where you can run your entire stuff on commodity hardware that can just come down and go up, it can, it can come up and it can go down any, at any point in time. And still the fault tolerance and the fact that you know, there are intelligent schedulers and the way our file system works and so on. A lot of those assumptions that have driven that design are very different from the assumptions that are driving uh, this design. Uh, and, uh, and until recently, uh, the, the, the other big challenge that has been that the parallel databases have had is that uh, they were all all built for structured data. And, uh, you know, even at, at some of the best, in, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the most famous, uh, the big, uh, largest installed uh, cluster size of uh, uh, of a parallel database actually is with, I think, with eBay, which runs about 5 petabytes of data on a 17, 17 node green plum cluster. So that's the largest size that you can actually think of that's been published uh, down there. I think there's one uh, other 19 node cluster, which is in the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison, which has actually got, uh, you know, 20, 30 nodes more than that. But if you look at a production cluster, that's probably with eBay who have been in, in, in green plum. That's the largest size of it. And, uh, and that is clearly an outlier. And by default, the average cluster size, whenever you actually go to any typical installation of these databases, whether it is Vertica or Netiza or any of the other ones, uh, is usually in about 10, or more, 10 to 12 nodes, 15 node kind of installation. So that's the kind of typical size that you have. And this kind of presents a unique challenge, which is that if you want to do rigorous QA on this, rigorous testing of this, to see what is the kind of load it can take, and if you want to do that, to a great extent, you are actually limited by the by very usage of it because you know uh, you'll have a long tail of these uh, 10 node, 5 node, 6 node kind of clusters and one outlying node which is like eBay and you know that's the only experience you're going to be uh, where you're going to be you know kind of stretching this database to its entire limits. And this has also largely played a big role in how uh, how these kind of systems are actually engineered to actually scale to and tens and thousands of nodes. So uh, well, this, is, uh, the, this was the uh, incumbent in that sense. It was the predominant technology that was sitting out there. Uh, amidst such a situation in 2006 is when uh, Hadoop began its uh, you know, little journey at that point in time. It started out as an open source project and was under the, under the Apache umbrella. Uh, it came, uh, the guy who wrote this, has, I'm sure all of you know this, and uh, you know, his, his name is Duck Cutting, and he was in basically the guy who wrote Lucene, and then he wrote the Nutch Crawling Infrastructure. And uh, what really was uh, the driver behind uh, the main goal, the intention with that uh, I was working towards at that point in time was it had nothing to do with databases or distributed systems or any of those things. His primary, primary goal at that point in time was to democratize search technology. All the knowledge of how you do ranking and how you do indexing and stuff like that was predominantly, you know, uh, concentrated within one company, Google. And at that point in time, there was no compelling open source alternatives and accessible one that other people could actually use. And uh, clearly, he wanted to kind of disrupt that and say, hey, if we want to do something different, we want to create accessible search engines and so on. That was the primary driver for him to actually start writing Nutsch and Lucene and then and once he finished the, the core search plus the crawl parts of it, then uh, you know he got into uh, around the same time the MapReduce paper came out of the Google uh, guys, so the Sanjay Gamavat and uh, the, you know Jeffrey Dean, who were uh, the primary who, who, who have the patent, who hold the patent for this. Uh, they basically came up with this whole MapReduce paper and the Google File System paper. And when he actually read that, uh, he quickly realized that that's what that's what he needs to actually build if he wants to you know start to take this to a much higher scale and so on. So he started working on this. And he called it Hadoop because his uh, son's toy, his son had a small toy, which was an elephant uh, toy, and his son was calling it Hadoop, and he just called this as Hadoop. There's no other reason why it was actually called uh, Hadoop. No real scientific thinking there. So clearly that was the early days of Hadoop. And in 2007, he was actually uh, hired by Yahoo. Yahoo saw a lot of potential in it, and they were pretty much in the same search business at that point in time, and now things have changed a lot in their world. 
and they probably go back to doing search again at some point. But effectively, they realize that uh, you know this is something that uh, they should support because and uh, given the computational resources that they had and the kind of problems that they were solving at their end, uh, they found this to be a fantastic uh, sort of a match made in heaven in some sense, and they brought Doug on board and he joined Yahoo. And within a span of about, uh, by end of 2007 or early 2008, uh, they were actually running a 4,000 node cluster. So they, much of the hardening of this, uh, of the Hadoop uh, infrastructure, the framework, and the MapReduce programming model, and the file system, and so on, actually happened as part of that uh, incubation that was happening inside of uh, Yahoo. And uh, so that, that's basically, and uh, around this time is when even uh, it, stayed, it kind of went and went and uh, became a top level Apache project and more contributions started coming out and you know it started to get more and more mind share in the developer community. Uh, at this point in time, I'll just make a slight digression and stop a little bit on this Hadoop story so far and I'll kind of share with you an interesting observation which is that anytime there is a change, whether it's a technology or whether it's a new change initiative that your organization or anything for that matter, every change goes through this acceptance life cycle. It starts with a good amount of resistance. When anybody says, you're not home, and somebody says, do try something different, there's a lot of resistance that you actually show first. And then there is, you know, after sustained, uh, if somebody keeps telling you, do this, do this, and then you kind of go and say, let me explore and try and see what is it that, uh, that this really has to offer. And if explorations give you something uh, fruitful in that sense, then is when you actually go and, you know, become an advocate of it, accept it, and start to use it at a, do that thing at a much more grander scale. And with Hadoop, uh, this, this, this model is as much applicable as with anything else in life. And uh, around the time when in 2007, to, uh, again in 2008, when its adoption started to go, the MapReduce patent was filed and it was even granted and all the papers were coming out and every all the research group community started to actually take, take this model a lot more seriously because it was the first time somebody had democratized uh, a distributed programming model. Normally, you're used to writing programs which run on one machine, but if you wanted a runtime environment in which you can write a program and the runtime environment guarantees that it will run on multiple machines and you will get your answers, this was the first time that something like this actually had come and become, main, become mainstream and all developers had access to it that they could set up clusters and so on. So given that it was getting a lot of mind share, a lot of resistance and backlash actually uh, was subject to Hadoop, primarily from the database community. Uh, even right now, uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, papers on, the, on the, which kind of describes this was a paper by a guy called Michael Stonebreaker. Michael Stonebreaker is a luminary in the database field and is primarily the person who came up with the, he's, he's an MIT professor at MIT and before that he was at UC Berkeley. And uh, where they, I think they, he conceived the post, post uh, the initial versions of the Postgres database and so on. So he has a long precedent in the database, uh, in the database research community and he's a very well respected person. Uh, so he and a bunch of other guys uh, from Microsoft Research and Yale and other universities, they came up with this whole paper called uh, MapReduce, uh, a big step backwards. So if you just Google for that, you'll get the whole paper out there, which kind of describes uh, what is wrong with MapReduce and how inefficient it is and so on. And, uh, you know, but this did not really decelerate the adoption of Hadoop in any way. I think uh, given that it was, uh, and then of course the Google guys had a very befitting response to that. They said, uh, if you wanted to do unstructured data processing, you can't impose a schema so early and then say, I use SQL and things like that. So I will not get into that, I will not digress into that debate. But nevertheless, uh, I think the, the point is that it went through its assistance. And the way, uh, and the biggest uh, impact that this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, dynamics that was going on in the community had was on the startups that were trying to, that were still trying to form. Cloudera was still trying to just form. They had just, uh, Doug and others had just left Yahoo and they had just floated this company called Cloudera, which would primarily focus on selling Hadoop distributions to enterprises. So for those kind of, and, and I think Hortonworks and Napa were not really there at that point and nobody else was doing, but they were all, I'm sure at some point in time they were all thinking of, you know, saying, hey, there's a potential business opportunity here, so let's go and commercialize this open source technology. So the biggest impact of this resistance and these dynamics was on those uh, companies. And uh, clearly everybody knew that Hadoop was a fantastic batch processing framework, but when it comes to online ad hoc querying and things like that, it was really not up to the mark, it was not really built for something like that. And uh, so what these companies uh, like Cloudera and others actually did was they kind of had to position Hadoop really, very, really, very really cleverly within uh, the enterprise stack. To, if you wanted to explain the value proposition of Hadoop to an enterprise architect and the CIO and the classic audience would eventually pay for this, they had to be really, really smart about how they had they positioned the product. 
And uh, consequently, you know, what they really did was that uh, they positioned Hadoop as not something that is here to dislodge Johnny BMSS and it's not here to dislodge any of the existing investments that had actually done. And instead, you know, Hadoop was something that would like complement a lot of this infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, if you were uh, if you were a media company or a publishing company and you had a lot of unstructured data, this was a fantastic store for storing in unstructured data. That's how when it come to, uh, came to unstructured data, they said there's, there's no better place to store it than actually in Hadoop. Because it gives you linear scale and as your data grows, the only thing that you need to do is throw more hardware at it and so on. And when it came to any kind of ETL and those kind of things, uh, what they really told was uh, instead of writing, writing all your ETL scripts in some, uh, some, uh, some other fashion, you could actually write them as MapReduce jobs. And given that you are running it on a parallel infrastructure, the time to, you know, time to insight or time to report kind of would massively crunch because of the fact that you could throw commodity hardware at it or if you wanted to throw more expensive hardware at it, whatever, whatever you have, you could do with it. So they had to be very, very kind of clever in positioning this as a very, you know, a complementary technology and not as something that would directly compete with the incumbent RDBMSs that were entrenched in, in enterprises. While this uh, smart move kind of really helped in the, it kind of, you know, added another, uh, it, so uh, it kind of added another uh, sort of uh, swing to the whole flywheel of the adoption of, uh, of uh, Hadoop. Uh, the one thing that it did lead to in very short time of span of time is this problem of splitting by structure. So you really, even in some of the implementations that uh, we have uh, thought we've talked to different clients and uh, try to understand what they're doing, what we really found was that uh, given the fact that Hadoop is basically nothing but a file system and then a compute model, you know, thrown on top of it, given the fact that it's fundamentally storing files, it's a lot more easier to actually bring in all kinds of data that you have in the enterprise and dump it on this particular file system. In the three V's of big data, the V that is most prevalent in the enterprise is the variety. It's not the volume, it's not the velocity. Velocity happens probably in trading firms or you know, social media analytics firms and so on. Right? But the variety aspect of it is what is most predominant. And if somebody can do anything with, to solve that problem or like to make that a little easier, I mean, it's a fantastic million dollar startup idea probably sitting out there. And you can, you can actually go a long way just trying to solve that problem. So the variety aspect of it, kind of uh, the fact that it was a very plastic infrastructure on which you could dump any kind of uh, data and then, you know, and it would replicate and give you all the goodness was what was the most attractive. But given the fact that while it offered the low entry barrier for data to come in and reside, uh, but when, as and when you, you know, uh, started processing that data and started moving it to other things like warehouses and things like that, it ended up creating two words. So basically you had this word which is represented by the, the, the left hand side of this picture which is all about, uh, you know, it's, it's a crumble file and you can just kind of put anything you want there. Then there was a structured word where you had to like really, uh, you would clean and then you would get it there and each time you wanted something extra from there, each time you wanted something uh, extra from there, you would have to copy more data and to kind of, uh, what made it really more funny is every parallel database vendor to protect his territory started to offer connectors. Connectors would do nothing else but just shuffle data from one side to another. It will just be choking your network and nothing else effectively. So clearly uh, this two world problem or split brain problem is uh, kind of created some leading questions uh, to both the, uh, the enterprise and more importantly to the research community. Uh, so basically the, the question, one part of the one part of the questions that was there from an enterprise perspective was how do I answer questions that whose answers will span across these two worlds? Uh, I know that unstructured data is sitting there or like all the, by default all the data kind of sits there now and I do a lot of these, you know, magic and to, you know, get it, into, get it into a more refined form in my database. But if I want to do anything which is more ad hoc, how can I put the power in the hands of users who would like, you know, normally write SQL queries and stuff like that in the before, in the, in the earlier scenario. How do you really solve that problem which, uh, you know, you know, you know, which, you know is, uh, which this has actually created? From a research perspective or from an open source uh, developer community perspective, people started asking the question about, you know, how can I really combine the strengths of these two pieces of infrastructure? I know that Hadoop has all this goodness of fault tolerance and, uh, you know, linear scale of data and the only thing I need to do is add hardware. And how do I know? But then the parallel databases and SQL in particular gave me this ability to interact with my data sets a lot more faster. It would like low latency queries if I do a select star from a table name. Uh, so that it doesn't even, it, it takes hardly a few seconds to actually get that answer and so on. So uh, how do I really combine these two strengths, the strengths of these two technologies? Can I create another set of, you know, possible infrastructure which will have both these things baked in? 
And uh, that kind of converged into this last question, which uh, which said how that kind of if you you know if you do some more thinking on it, the essential question there is, can I run SQL directly on top of data sitting inside HDFS or data sitting sitting inside the Hadoop infrastructure? So that's the leading question that it kind of that's the question that all these other you know uh, brainstorming and thinking actually led to. And uh, so this I mean this is sort of how you know that that question becomes a, a SQL on Hadoop becomes a natural extension to the in the evolution of it. So this sort of the, this is what I wanted to cover in the first part, and uh, so given that you kind of understood uh, how you know you've gotten to this point, it will be interesting to see what are the technical approaches or the mechanics of actually doing SQL on Hadoop. And at this point in time, there are broadly three different classes of uh, technical architectures or technical solutions that people have started to they are exploring and they are building products and they are all going and uh, they, each of them is following its own kind of path to doing SQL on Hadoop. Uh, the, 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 basically, one is faster hive. Hive, I'm sure all of you have, you know, in some form they are familiar with. Uh, they are basically, uh, you know, uh, there are a bunch of companies who are trying to do uh, query processing on hive a lot faster. So anybody who's written a hive query will know how long it actually takes to, you know, give you back an answer. In one of our very early experiments, I thought was we were uh, like, uh, pushing a lot of log data, about 25 GB of log data into the hive infrastructure every day. And uh, it would range from anywhere between three minutes to something like ten minutes and things like that. Because it's ultimately what Hive is doing is taking a SQL or the subset of the query language, SQL query language that it supports, and converts that into a pipeline of MapReduce jobs, so that you don't have to write the MapReduce jobs all by yourself, and you can still, you know, stick to your familiar user experience of working with SQL. And then, uh, you know, you can do a select star, you can do joins, you can do a bunch of things that you are normally used to as database users. Uh, I will not be covering a lot of hype, a lot about hype. Uh, there are a couple of companies you can actually take a look at. Cubol is one startup in Bangalore. Uh, this is the guys who wrote hype when they were in Facebook. Uh, they came out and they started this company, and their primary value proposition is hype on the cloud. And they're trying to do a bunch of optimizations to the hype code base itself so that it plays nicely with the different cloud infrastructures. At this point in time, it's mostly most of their customers are working on the Amazon cloud, so it's very optimized for. Uh, you know, whenever the query goes in, it starts and it returns and stuff like that. It will do a bunch of things to interact with the rest of the Amazon ecosystem like S3 and EC2 and so on. Uh, it doesn't use Elastic MapReduce, it directly goes on EC2 plus uh, S3. I won't get into some of that uh, and, uh, and that. And the, I'll be focusing on the other two parts of it, which is, you know, distributed query processing and then there is uh, split query processing. I'll get into a little bit of the details of how these systems actually work. But by and large, these two uh, are, uh, they follow a different model, which is that distributed query processing is all about, how, like, uh, like the earlier examples I showed about uh, Hawk and SQLH and so on. Uh, they are the here the, the intent is to actually run SQL directly on the data that is sitting on HDFS. You are not pulling data, you are not, you are basically not writing MapReduce jobs and so on, but you are writing a distributed query processing engine, which is smart enough to know where data is, by piggybacking on the Hadoop uh, uh, file systems, uh, you know, elements like the name node and the data nodes and so on. And based on that, it kind of figures out where my data is and it goes and executes it over there. So it still tries to preserve data locality and stuff like that. I'll illustrate that with an example. But effectively, distributed query processing is all about going out there and, you know, executing the query in, in the place where data is sitting there on the, on the distributed file system. Uh, the next one is, uh, you know, split query processing. This is perhaps probably the most complex uh, solution that is getting built over there. And I'll be explaining the, uh, <coughs> the details of this with an example, which is Microsoft's Ponybase. Uh, here, effectively, when I say split, uh, you know, query processing, it means there are, you know, the query processing is not happening in a single environment, like how it happens in the distributed query processors. It actually happens in two environments, and I'll explain that with an example on what exactly happens and what the life cycle of a query is and so on uh, in the next remaining slides. So we'll start with uh, distributed query processing, and uh, the basic idea here is there is HDFS, and there is some level of, uh, then you need to impose a schema, a schema is imposed on the data that is sitting in HDFS, and then there is this infrastructure that is provided by the query processor through which you can actually, you know, push your queries, it will give you, it will execute the query and it will give you back results. And uh, the best way to kind of understand distributed query processing is by actually looking at the example of, uh, of one of the distributed query processors that is out there. Uh, right now, if you see, uh, leading the whole pack in distributed query processors is uh, Cloudera's Impala. Uh, it is, it's in 1.1 version right now and, uh, you know, it's, in, it's, it's out there for general availability. It came, I think, uh, it, uh, the, the GA was made available during uh, May, May, June time frame. 
and its adoption has not like actually you know, it's not gone skyrocketing but it's people are starting to try it out a lot of the enterprise clients like banks and insurance companies they are actually starting to explore impala from, uh, from uh, to see if they can actually you know uh, see use it for their uh, reporting and other needs uh, so we'll start by uh, kind of uh, explaining by going through the architecture of impala so I'm going to assume a little bit about uh, of, uh, that the familiarity with HDFS in particular. This doesn't involve so much of the MapReduce side of the Hadoop. It's more the HDFS side of Hadoop that actually is uh, uh, what we can really require here. So if you just look at the block diagram and see what this uh, what Impala actually contains, is, uh, at the outermost level is your clients, and uh, Impala comes with JDBC drivers, ODBC drivers. It has its own shell. Uh, like the way you have a SQL shell in Oracle and so on, you have its own shell, and then there are you can obviously interface a lot of BI tools. That's the whole idea behind this: that you can directly interface a lot of BI tools on top of this infrastructure uh, uh, if you if you have a, a system like Impala. And uh, basically, uh, this whole journey starts with the HDFS. So you have the HDFS name node, and then you have the data nodes that are sitting there. Uh, uh, what really happens? So, so once you once you assume that that infrastructure is there, uh, now imagine that on every data node there is another daemon process that is running, that, and that is what I mean by the Impala daemon here. Uh, there is a small daemon process that is actually running on every data node, and uh, that basically uh, you know does the the primary responsibility of this daemon is to do things like query, query coordination, query planning, and and the query execution. The whole life cycle of a query. Is actually you know controlled by, by each of these single uh, demons. In addition to that, uh, what you really require is uh, if once a query comes, what you really need along with that is uh, the some way to kind of say uh, this is a valid query or an invalid query and so on. So a lot of that information is uh, is actually stored in the metadata catalog. Uh, the metadata catalog that is used inside Impara is exactly the same as the metadata catalog that's used inside Hive. In fact, it's just been I think you have the option of uh, uh, it, you can, uh, it, it's a little funny because it's effectively a MySQL or Postgres database that is sitting behind the scenes which has data about your data. So it has a table and columns by which you can say which table, what columns and what are the data types and things like that. So you start this, uh, uh, the metadata catalog is primarily the guy who kind of has that metadata about uh, all the schema, the, the schema information that, uh, that your queries will actually use. Uh, in addition to that, there is another interesting component which is called the, the state store. Uh, the state store, in some ways, is uh, is the initial. It's in some ways, it's uh, it will eventually probably become a full-fledged uh, scheduler. But at this point in time, the primary responsibility of the state store is to kind of keep track of uh, how many machines uh, are running uh, are healthy at this point in time from a perspective of uh, you know running queries and so on. So the name node already offers you the information on where my data blocks are and which are the data blocks, the data nodes that are actually running. But given that for a particular query, you will have only a subset of the whole cluster which will be responsible for running that query, or which will have the data for actually answering that query. Uh, the state store kind of offers this uh, extra information on at this point in time how many of those are actually healthy. So it's some kind of a schedule. It's the guy you will actually refer to to get the real time information on like where really my data is. Can I really, on um, all the data nodes that are candidate data nodes, from that, which subset can I actually schedule my query and so on? Is, is this using Zookeeper? Zoo which one? Is this using Zookeeper? No, this is at this point in time, it's not using Zookeeper. So, but uh, Hadoop inherently has that. So, like, what? what Hadoop inherently, I mean, Zookeeper is, uh, is used along with uh, Hadoop, but in this, in this case, they are not using. So far, they are not used. So uh, this is sort of a static view, and uh, you know uh, the uh, the better way to kind of go through and understand what happens in Impala is by actually looking at a dynamic view of the the whole query lifecycle. So we'll quickly run through what the lifecycle of a query looks like in in Impala. So the first and the foremost uh, thing is uh, you have the Impala client which issues a query to any of these nodes. Uh, the big difference between the shared nothing parallel databases and distributed query processors is you don't have a coordinator node. Every node can act as a coordinator node in itself. So anybody, you can send the query to any of these Impala demons running and running across the cluster. They are all running on different machines, and each of them uh, are intelligent enough. They have all the logic to actually execute and control the, they kind of manage the lifecycle of that particular query. So once you actually, once a Impala daemon actually resides, uh, you know, gets the query request, next thing it does is sort of go through this whole parse and generate a planned lifecycle of the query. 
Uh, if you uh, just taking a step back, if you what typically happens inside a database when you issue a query is the SQL is parsed, it converted into a tree, and then uh, this uh, that's called the uh, logical plan, and then a bunch of optimizations are applied on that, which is you know which results in a physical plan, and the physical plan is usually uh, the one which kind of gets executed. Uh, except that in the case of a distributed processor, in addition to getting the physical plan, you have an ex you have a, a third step, which is about getting an execution plan because. Uh, all this, this query really needs to be scheduled on different machines. So in order, to, so you have to know which machines to go and you know where to have to execute the queries. And so you have this additional step of generating an execution plan. So you have the logical plan, then the physical plan, and then finally the execution plan. Uh, in this particular case, uh, once it once an Impala daemon re receives this query, uh, it validates the whole, uh, it passes SQL and it validates the correctness of that SQL in by actually talking to the metadata catalog. The metadata catalog is basically, you know, as I said before, it contains a lot of the schema information. Uh, once that is obtained, uh, you know, it uh, kind of goes through this next step where in order to, uh, so it knows what table you are referring to. If I say select star from table name and a bunch of things like that, you, it gets the information on which tables uh, you are referring to from this first step. Uh, but what you really need to know is where is the data for this uh, table actually residing in my cluster. Uh, for which it actually, you know, goes to the name node. HDFS name node basically ha ha has a lot of this information on uh, you know which which data node contain what the blocks how the block distribution is what the layout is and so on so it talks to the HDFS name node and in uh, you know it, once it gets it gets the list of all the data nodes that are possible places where the data for this because HDFS actually replicates it will actually even give you information on where the replicas are and how, how the different data nodes and so on so once that information is there uh, along with that it then consults the state store to now see which Impala demons are actually alive at this point in time from that subset. Because not all the nodes in the cluster need to be, uh, they don't necessarily have to be running the Impala demons. It would have crashed in some plus other places. So only the state store knows uh, which are, it keeps track of, uh, just as your name node keeps track of which data nodes come up and go, in the same way, the state store keeps track of which, uh, uh, you know, which nodes in the cluster are at this point in time running the Impala demon. So uh, once it has all this information, it uh, kind of it, it generates the it goes goes through this whole process of generating the physical plan, and what is notable about Impala with respect to the physical plan is that uh, this entire code which you, you got SQL that got converted it's all written in C++ so uh, you you get the SQL it gets converted into a into a tree of you know a, a data structure in C++ and in the final step of generating the execution plan it converts that entire C++ tree into assembly code. And actually, Impala uses the very latest in assembly language standard. It's called SSE 4.3. That's the, the standard that it actually supports. So it has a lot of uh, constructs which uh, are which are supported by a lot of the modern processors like the Intel NeLAM range and the uh, there's also a there, there's also a I think it's called Bull, uh, from AMD there's a set of processors which uh, it's called I think the uh, bulldozer. bulldozer or Bulldog or one of those. Sorry, I don't I can't remember. So yeah, the, the, that, that is the subset of uh, assembly language which is supported uh, by the, it, the assembly code is generated in that uh, in that dialect. And once you have that information, and uh, you know you figured out, you, you go through the execution, uh, executing the execution plan. So which is to kind of figure out which are the other demons that I have to farm this, you know, ship this assembly code to. So it basically ships off the assembly code to all the candidate Impala nodes that are sitting inside the inside the cluster. <laughs> And uh, the, there is one, this node acts as a control node for this particular query and it ends up actually, you know, collecting back all the results. The results can be streamed back. Again, uh, it does not necessarily stream back the results just in time to the client because it depends on what kind of SQL constructs you're using. If you've got an order by, then you really have to wait and do the sorting over here and then only finally ship it off to the client. But if you have some other kind of clients, it may start streaming the results much sooner if you don't, if you don't have those kind of constructs. So effectively, it uh, just goes off. It, 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 the one single daemon is capable of controlling the entire life cycle of a query and, uh, you know, resulting throwing the results back uh, to its clients. So I'll take a pause here and then, you know, we will leave it open for a few questions because before they go there, it'll be a little bit of a digression from. This. I'm a little confused. Is there a layer like HP because you're talking about tables? Uh, is there a layer like HP here somewhere? Uh, no, it's not like edge based. The metadata catalog is the one which is storing the table information. So, what do you mean by table? Do I, when I put in data, do I have to structure it and put it in, or is it like. Yes, you have to structure it because that's the premise for SQL, right? That you have to have a structure. Also, is there any, like, for example, when it is going to climb to the data node and there are multiple data nodes, what decide which data node does it go to? 
Yeah, so that is based on the, the uh, so at this point in time, if you see, uh, the first the first level filtering happens by talking to the name node. So once you get to know that this is the, uh, you know, what do you say, um, these are the tables that I want to refer, there has to be a mapping of tables to data blocks, data nodes. And you get that information partly from Manitata catalog and partly from the name node. Because name node knows, you know, uh, you know these the metadata catalog knows what data blocks, the, what uh, uh, what files it is actually referring to, where the data is actually stored. And by talking to a name node, you can get to know what are the data nodes that are actually uh, responsible for storing the data for this particular file. So then the query coordinator actually, you know, mixes these two information to figure out what are the possible places where I can go to to actually execute the query. And then the state store tells you which of them are actually running at this point. And you first go to HDL, HDL, HDL. It goes to, I mean, I don't know the exact sequence in which it goes, but in the life cycle, you go to all the three people. Most likely, you go to the metadata catalog first, because that's the guy who tells you the file, uh, the data file name uh, that actually is, needs to uh, in which the data is. And then the other guys will give you the rest of the information. So how does this metadata catalog get built? Is it static or it gets updated? You can update it. You have the, the shell and they have APIs through which you can actually uh, can do a creative table name and those kind of things. This lifecycle will work for a distributed database? This is completely distributed. It's completely from ground up. And that's the one significant difference between this and a lot of other NoSQL databases that, uh, you know, this is, you know, the, I mean, this is one A running SQL on a distributed infrastructure. It's completely distributed. What's the fundamental difference between this and HPH? I mean, I understand the assembly, uh, that's, that's quite new, right? I mean, but other than that, what's so I am no expert on HBS, I will try to give an answer. I think, firstly, uh, it is this follows the same, uh, the data modeling and semantics are different. They are the, I, I mean, I think you have the Google Big Table inspired uh, column family based uh, data model there. This is a normal RDBMS kind of a data model. And uh, the other thing is, uh, HBS is fundamentally uh, what we call as a log structured database. So it's usually built for high write through groups. So this one, I don't know, I don't think I will use this for, uh, you know, high write throughput. You would want to do this in the same, you would use it as part of your warehouse infrastructure or reporting infrastructure and things like that. Fundamentally, you can do relational queries. Yes, you can do SQL relational queries. SQL 92 is the dialect that is supported. I think the, uh, the IPARA doesn't support that. The VAPAR guys, what the Apache Drill supports SQL 92. This is still uh, a slightly, this is actually high, high, high QL at this point in time. They have plans of actually supporting more combinators and complex. So, without getting into religious world, I mean, there's been like all the green plum and everyone has been talking about superiority of column and data locality and everything. So, does that metadata catalog anything? Yeah, because uh, in the metadata catalog, you can pretty much specify the column format. See, the superiority of the columnar databases in, is in the fact that you don't store the, 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 data, the layout of the data on the hard disk. That is where the difference lies. And given the fact that we are storing all columns together instead of rows together, you know, it helps you to pick up the data for all columns in one single go. And then uh, the only trade-off is that it's compressed and kept. So when you bring it here, you will have to decompress it, which means some CPU weight will be there. But the fact is that you're getting all the data for, for a single column. So that is the fundamental law for columnar, uh, why it performs much faster for these kind of workloads. That doesn't change here at all, because that is about, uh, given the fact that uh, the community is working so hard on parameterizing the file format types, Parquet is the columnar format that has actually come up with it. Uh, and you can actually specify also the what kind of format it's using and so on. So that, uh, I, I think, I, from what I can understand, I think it does take, it can take advantage of that. And even if not, you can actually make a change to this infrastructure to take advantage of that. I think even the Hive community is doing the same thing. They're saying that this Hive format is a very straightforward, it's a parameterized thing in that world. So as long as there is like a record reader which uh, implement, implementation for that particular file format, uh, it's not about the format, it's about locality, right? I mean, Data locality is still preserved here. It's still preserved because now with the help of them, that's the fundamental advantage of, uh, you know, uh, going through a Hadoop infrastructure. Otherwise, you don't need HDFS. You can go the, you can, you don't need to have that kind of uh, infrastructure. So, uh, the other thing to note about is that any time you, uh, you know, uh, you talk about a distributed system, uh, one of the ways by which you can actually uh, qualify or you can judge the quality of that architecture is via this uh, notion of uh, the single points of failure. 
And uh, I, I think the end of, uh, and uh, this is one of the concerns that's actually raised when you evaluate a distributed architecture like Impala and compare it with some other things. Uh, the fundamental thing here is, uh, uh, the, the, I think the, if you just were looking at it, you know, the fact that one Impala even goes down will not necessarily stop you from actually executing the query. It can go to any other, you know, it can resubmit the query to any other Impala team. And uh, the other thing is that the metadata catalog is still a point of, a point of failure. Uh, but the way the Impala daemons work around the problem is by caching the data. Once it actually hits, when the Impala daemon talks to the metadata catalog, it actually caches the data. And it also gives you some constructs by which you can invalidate the cache. So that you, you know, solve that problem in some, you know, in a clean way. Uh, so that is one of the ways it actually works around. The state store, in my personal opinion, is still actually a, you know, a point of failure. Because if it goes down, uh, you know, what the, the Impala documentation kind of nicely words it and it says that, no, no, it's not such a big deal and so on. But fundamentally, the state store, even here also it tries to cache the information that is coming from the state store. But the state store is, uh, you know, it's, it's far more uh, in the sense that its state keeps changing every now and then. Anytime something goes up or goes down, this guy actually has information. Uh, the only saving grace here is that if you are in the middle of the, of the execution of a query, uh, what can happen is that uh, if you have, if the state store goes down, you don't have that information with you, the query will fail if it is scheduled on a node which does not have uh, where the Impala daemon has actually crashed. And so uh, the way these guys counter that, uh, the counter argument that they give is that if it crashes, uh, the queries will run so fast that you can resubmit the query again. So it does not have that level of fault tolerance that is baked in, uh, that you see in the MapReduce world where it will reschedule the query on the, the job on another uh, machine and so on. That intelligence is not there. It's going to come in the next versions, but at this point in time, I personally consider the state store to be a point of failure. But it's, I mean, in practical, for all practical purposes, it's not such a very big deal. It's more a, in some ways, a purist argument. So, I'm trying to understand, in fact, for the previous session of what is the business application of something like Impala? Um, we've been talking about this will distribute, it will be SQL-like, whatever. But where do I use it? I mean, I think in, in the case of Impala, I would say wherever you're using SQL, especially for analytical workloads or for reporting workloads, this is a fantastic... Uh, yeah, so then that gives rise to another question, which is, so what is the fundamental problem with RDBM systems? And maybe I'm digressing a little You see, if you don't have a problem that you have experienced in your enterprise, then don't Definitely. shift the infrastructure. I'm sorry, I didn't know the question. The question is, the fundamental problem with them is that the usage time of an RDBM system about you know, 0.5 percent or what have you for the useful query, but they spend a lot of time in asset transactions or you know, supporting asset or supporting logs because they have to support asset or in the housekeeping jobs and what have you. Right? So they're equally distributing all those four quadrants, which is about 20 percent of each of them. So now all of this is fine because they're trying to solve a different problem. So I'm, my basic fundamental question before I even get into Impala or what have you is, so where do I use it? Do I use it after I have done all sort of OLTP, real-time transactional applications, and then apply you know, some sort of a cube, you know, data analytical processing or what have you? Where do I use it? But this is not for OLTP. This is not for OLTP. That's it's the only for OLAP. It's only for, at least this point in time, it is for OLAP. But the, uh, so the, I mean, if you got an investment that you've already made in either parallel database, which is very common in all the enterprises, that given the fact that parallel databases have been around for a while, a lot of the enterprises that we walk into normally have these, uh, you know, incumbent sitting over there. But one thing clearly is that they they are extremely expensive. And if you are starting your journey today, the, I wouldn't make a, such a recommend a solution of that kind, which you have to make such a big upfront investment in there. And the second thing is that, uh, as I mentioned before, there are they, if you want, if you're looking at linear scalability of data, if you want your infrastructure to, if you basically don't want to be changing your software just because there is more data flown in in the next five years, and if you've got those kind of needs for, if you project those kind of, uh, that kind of growth in your own data sizes and volumes, and, and for that matter, uh, from a variety point of view, uh, then uh, piggybacking on an infrastructure like this is a lot more, uh, it's a lot more meaningful. Primarily because uh, on, once your data is sitting inside HDFS, uh, you can map this metadata catalog on top of that and use it via a SQL on Adobe. And for some, if you want to do any kind of exploratory analysis, you don't have to replicate the data. The data can still be residing inside HDFS, and you can run a bunch of map reduce jobs from the other side on top of this. So this kind of flexibility you never really had. I agree, but in a typical analytical processing platforms, 
the if you were developing a queue, you, I'm sure that you would want to run a single query on top of the queue. I understand this system, but when we talk about running you know, commodity hardware-based distributed systems and so forth and so on, I don't understand the need for SQL. Why invest in you don't understand the need for SQL. Structured query language, because that's why. Well, I mean, that's how that's, uh, you that's would be running. That's precisely the question. So, how would you? So, where is the application of having SQL on hundreds or thousands of nodes? See, and the I fact. Think, let's say I, I think there are two parts to that question. One is where is the need for running SQL, and then where is the need for running it on an infrastructure like this? The infrastructure SQL part is the, the thing that business SQL. users don't care about. The, what they really care about is SQL. So, so far you never had an infrastructure that would run SQL on an infrastructure like this. Do you get the point? So, no, I think my question is actually the hybrid. It's not the different question. Mm -hmm. So, where in we're saying that everybody is working towards, now that we figured out that reduce and yarns of the world, and now I have to run a structured query language on top of them, Question is the structure. Why do you need structured query language? I understood from your. For your reporting, you you always use such, such a query language. Right? That's what you have been doing for so many years. And we are saying that you don't have to change that. You don't have to change your entire reporting analytics team into a set of MapReduce experts. If you want to do MapReduce, you can still do it. You don't have to duplicate data. You don't have to replicate data and all that. I think we should take it. Off. Yeah, we can take it offline and talk more about that. So uh, just moving on, I think this is uh, the story of uh, the distributed query processes. And I'll try and see how best I can explain because it's a little bit more complicated in the in the architecture as you would see. Uh, the third variety of uh, in which people are doing SQL on Hadoop is based on uh, on, the, on the notion of a split uh, query, a split query process, uh, notion of a split query processing. So what you basically mean here is that since you're saying split, there must be two halves or two parts to it, and that's quite the case in this case. And uh, leading the the, 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 the example that I'll be taking to illustrate uh, split query processing is that of uh, my, of a system called Microsoft from, from Microsoft called Polybase. This is still not a production ready product. It's actually a research where a project that's happening out of uh, Wisconsin Madison. Uh, Microsoft Research has funded a lab there and they are trying to work on this uh, system. Uh, it's interesting from a, from a very pure technical point of view. So from a, from a business point of view and things like that, it's not yet ready prime time for some, something like this. But purely from a, uh, from a from the way in which you can do SQL, another way in which you can do SQL and Hadoop, this offers a fairly uh, you know, a fantastic case study to kind of understand and feel good about. So the basic idea here is that you have two environments. And uh, this is uh, for those kind of situations where you already have a parallel database. So in this case, uh, we, the parallel database that we're talking about here is the Microsoft parallel database. It's called SQL Server PDW, parallel data warehouse. Uh, so the, what happens over here is that you start with a parallel database uh, environment as the primary environment in which all the action happens. The entire user experience of you working with a Hadoop cluster is actually driven from uh, from your from the interface of that that is, that is offered by the parallel database. Now you have, uh, so let me talk a little bit about what in this particular case, uh, what are the salient uh, components of uh, the uh, SQL Server PDW. Uh, so you have, uh, so as you, we can relate back to the first slide I showed, you have, it follows a shared nothing sort of an architecture. It has uh, the control node here which acts as the gateway for the rest of the world. And then uh, there are some interesting components like uh, we're starting a SQL Server process which is probably running the, the it's running, it's, it's, made, it's, made, it's making the entire infrastructure available on a certain port. So you can feed in your queries to that uh, component there, and then uh, you have the loader. Uh, you have the loader manager. Sorry. You have the the loader manager, which kind of is used in the case of load, data load operations. If you want to do bulk data loads and so on, and then you have something called the DMS or the data move service. Uh, a data move service is a very critical part of most uh, you know database, most parallel databases, because this is the guy who is responsible for shuffling data to, during the execution of a single, during the life cycle of a single query. So it, sometimes what you really have to do is uh, you have to copy data from two different nodes and bring it on to a third node and then do all the joins over there or do all the sorting over there because it's a lot more efficient to do it that way. So the DMS service is actually a pretty key component of most parallel databases. And then finally you have the uh, engine service which is uh, the one who actually passes the query, generates the plans and then you know farms it off for, uh, for the execution and so on. Uh, so, given this kind of an infrastructure, uh, if you and if you want to really onboard, uh, if you, and if you want to sort of you know uh, extend uh, this infrastructure to accommodate a Hadoop cluster, what is it that you have to fundamentally do? Uh, the first, I mean, if you just kind of you know dump it down a little bit, if you want two 
places, if you want to travel between two different places, the first thing that you would do is build a bridge. And that's what these guys have also done. They have got an HDFS bridge, which resides on all the different compute nodes. And this is responsible for moving any kind of data between uh, the path, between the Hadoop world and, and this uh, structured parallel database world. Uh, now, once you have this bridge, you can kind of impose, you can, you can take advantage of any Hadoop cluster that you might actually have. So you might be storing a lot of data for whatever reasons in that place because it's unstructured or because it is, uh, you know, uh, because it's kind of easier to or cheaper to scale in that kind of infrastructure and so on. And uh, and if you want to really, uh, you know, go do a run, run a query which spans across these two worlds, then the HDF bridge is acting as the as the as the bridge, as it slightly says, to traverse from one world to another world and come back. And uh, before I really get into the, uh, this is again a static view. It's a little hard to understand how the whole thing comes together in the static view. Uh, before I get onto the dynamic lifecycling view. Uh, what I would want to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you would do. Uh, typically, I've shown this, you know, in this animation here as a Hadoop cluster coming from nowhere and sitting over there. But how does it really happen in, uh, from a syntax point of view? How does it really work? Uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that. So uh, the first step that you would do in UI, we are using Polybase, is register a Hadoop cluster with uh, the parallel papers. So that you would do by uh, by following a very familiar uh, DDL syntax that uh, you normally follow, like create table table there. As simple as that, you would actually follow right create Hadoop cluster cluster name with name node so and so, job tracker so and so, and whatnot. So by doing this step, you actually told uh, Polybase that uh, there is a Hadoop cluster out there, and that is where I'm going to be. That is where uh, that is also going to participate in all the queries that you will be executing each time there is a query that is coming in. So given that uh, first step, the next thing that you want to do is impose a structure on the data that is sitting inside HDFS. So you have to map the HDFS to certain uh, abstractions that are provided to you by the database. And uh, here you have, uh, you again follow the notion of an external table that I think all the databases have started to offer now. So you say create external table, table name, and each of these columns, and you provide your own column names and then the, uh, you know, the data types and any constraints and so on like that. And then here you actually also specify where the location is on HDFS. So this is where you say, this is the file that is sitting on HDFS in some data node there, uh, you know, that is mapped to, that uh, which has the contents for this particular table. And along with that, as I mentioned earlier, even these guys offer the ability to specify the format. Here I'm saying text format, but you can do parquet, you can do, oh, I mean, I think, what is this, what is this there? I think uh, sequence files or whatever, you know, you know, file formats you actually have. So uh, this is, this is Given that you do these two things as a prior step, now you're ready to actually execute, uh, go through the life cycle of a query and execute a query here. Uh, the query again here, uh, kind of the, the journey of a query starts when uh, the client submits. Again, these guys have JDBC, ODBC interfaces and all that, just as SQL Server has. And uh, you can kind of submit, you submit a query to the SQL Server, uh, the, the main control, to the control node. And uh, this guy then passes it on to the engine service which you know, passes it and generates uh, a logical plan. Uh, what is interesting to kind of note here is that the plan generation is a very, very sophisticated step in this whole infrastructure. Now, uh, given that you have uh, a plan that is actually generated, uh, three things can actually happen. You, you could say, depending on the query that you're actually executing, you could, you could, uh, you could say that uh, I'm select, you could be referencing an external table entirely. You could just be saying select star from customer master or something like that, which means that if the external table resides inside the Hadoop cluster, then this whole query really needs to be executed in the Hadoop cluster. So that's the decision that the query process has to take. And when he takes that kind of a decision, then he kind of intimates of the, that decision to the engine service. And then the engine service kind of, what it really does, it converts that entire query into a MapReduce job and pushes it, pushes that to the, you know, the, to the job track in the Hadoop world. So the whole query gets executed there. The other possibility is that no, nothing from the Hadoop world is actually referenced in this particular query, in which case everything will actually happen here. And the most interesting category is the, you know, the bit one, where part of that table, you really have to do a join between data that is sitting inside your parallel warehouse and what is sitting inside your Hadoop cluster. And uh, you know, we are running out of time, so we can talk a little bit offline about how that happens. It's a very interesting process, and it goes through multiple rounds of uh, optimizations. And in, before it actually comes and decides, uh, it generates a, a tree, and then you know, based on 
what kind of uh, inputs go into that tree, it actually decides whether that node in the tree needs to be sh converted into a map reduced job and shipped off to the other cluster or it should be kept here and so on. So I won't get it, I mean, I would love to get into the details, but if there is interest, we can talk about it offline. But effectively, uh, the decisions are that. It could exe entirely execute the query here on this infrastructure, or it could entirely execute the query in the other infrastructure, Hadoop infrastructure, or it could move data via the HGFS bridge between the two worlds and then execute that query and do job joins and so on. So this, this is basically how uh, Polybase actually works.